I want to begin this evening by expressing my gratitude for those men who are willing to lead in our worship services, especially those who lead our singing. Uh, you know, uh, for as long as I've been here, up until uh, just a, a couple of months ago, there has usually only been one song leader. Uh, when we came here, Richard was, was still well in his health and able to do that, and uh, he has since had to, to stop, and hopefully he'll be able to, to do that again at some time. And, and then Danny willingly took over that, and Russell filled in some uh, when needed. And then Gary showed up, and he, he's been the only song leader for since he came. But lately, we've had other men stepping up, and I'm, I'm so thankful for that. It's good for the congregation, and it's good for those who lead, so they don't get burned out on that. So Jeff, thank you. You're doing a great job. Gary, you too. Appreciate it. Keep up the good work. I was intrigued as we were singing that song. You know, oftentimes I begin my comments by saying, uh, challenging your thinking to be sure that you don't, you're not singing a lie. And I've often said it's as easy to sing a lie as it is to tell a lie. And that song is, is one that is particularly easy to sing a lie if you're not careful. And I mean by that, that Jesus said in John 14 and verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. And so we're singing about, oh, how I love Jesus. And I'm not, uh, not indicting anyone tonight, but just think about it. As you live your life this week, are you obeying the commandments of the Lord? Because he said that's how you show that you love him. Oh, how I love Jesus. Well, of course, last week we began this series of sermons that has been published in our bulletin for some time. Uh, and we dealt with the topic last week, Why Me, Lord? Oftentimes that question is asked when it comes to our human suffering and things that uh, we endure that we don't like to endure. Why me? And uh, we answered some of the questions sometimes that happens with that. Tonight we're going to begin thinking about life's challenges and I felt I would be remiss if I did not begin by talking about one of the greatest challenges that man has ever known. And that challenge, of course, is sin. You know, if we're all being honest with ourselves, I think we would all be forced to admit that it is difficult to give up sin. It is hard to stop doing those things that bring us pleasure that are oftentimes wrong and sinful and ungodly and start walking the straight and narrow path. It's a difficult thing. And, and interestingly, the old King James Version, which uses the word straight there in Matthew 7, is the very word that means difficult. It is a difficult and hard way. And so let's think about overcoming sin tonight. While it is true that life has its problems... Not all problems, not all challenges are of the same weight and importance. For instance, some of the challenges we face, some of the problems that we have in life are material in nature and temporal in consequence. On the other hand, some of the challenges and problems that we face in life are spiritual in nature and eternal in consequence. You see, there's a vast difference between those two ideas. Now, sin is the first and the greatest problem and challenge that man must deal with. In fact, that is the story of the Bible, isn't it? The Bible begins with the creation account. And very shortly after the creation account, we find the fall of man. Man being tempted and led into sin. And from there, the story continues to decline. And we are introduced in Genesis chapter 3. I believe the verse is 15 of the, the Savior, the coming Savior, all the way back in the book of Genesis, prophesied. And so God saw fit to give man a way to deal with this problem. But you see, from the very beginning of the Bible to the very end of the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, the theme of the Bible is Christ the Redeemer. And if you look hard enough, you will see Jesus Christ in every book of the Bible without exception. Christ is pictured in every book of the Bible, and that is the theme. God wants man to, to focus on Christ and to use Christ as the remedy to this problem and challenge of sin. Well, why is that the theme of each book of the Bible? Why is that the theme of the Bible in its entirety? And the answer to that question is because man 
has to deal with the problem of sin. So I want us to consider what the Bible has to say about sin tonight, about this problem. And there are several problems that we encounter and that we deal with, many challenges we face because of that little three-letter word, sin. And so tonight, we're going to look at the answers to five problems we deal with regarding sin. The problem of what? In other words, what is sin? The problem of who? Who does it affect and who is a sinner? The problem of when? When do we become sinners? The problem of, uh, of why? Why we have to deal with it? And then we'll wrap up by considering the problem of how. How do we deal with it? How do we overcome this challenge and this problem. So let's begin with the first of those questions or the first of the problems that we deal with with sin and that is the problem of what? What is sin? Now it seems like a very basic and elementary question. However, I believe it's an important question that we must address because in our religious world, sin has been minimized to the point that it is, you would think, extinct. You would think that sin does not exist in this world that we currently live in. And yet we know that that is not the case. Instead of calling sin, sin today as it should be, we are tempted to, along with the rest of the world, simply call it uh, some kind of disorder or an alternate lifestyle. That is especially true with some sins. For instance, the sin of homosexuality, and, and now people are not advancing the, the biblical truth about that sin and calling it what it is, but they're just calling it an alternate lifestyle. And, and we've even moved further away from it than that. We're not even calling it an alternate these days, and people are advancing the false idea that man is born that way. Such a sad thing that we deal with. We need to understand that sin is a transgression of God's law. The Bible clearly displays and, 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 and shows us that in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. And that's where John says anyone who commits sin transgresses also the law because sin is transgression of the law. That is what sin it is breaking the commandments of God. Now the example of that, the, the most clear way I can illustrate the truth of what John said in 1 John 3 and verse 4 is to go back to the beginning. If you go back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17, you find God giving Adam and Eve that one command, one thing that they could not do, one tree that they could not eat of its fruit. Of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat you shall surely die. One tree they couldn't eat of. So that's the commandment that God gave them. Well, you turn to the very next chapter, Genesis chapter 3, and the account begins with the serpent coming in who was more subtle than every creature that was created. And the, the serpent, representative of Satan, Satan himself, comes and, and subtly tempts man to sin. And he throws in one word, added one word to God's command. You shall not surely die. He says, God, know, God knows that when you eat of this fruit, you'll become like God's and, and you'll know the things that God knows. And thus man fell. Man ate of that fruit and thus became a sinner because he had transgressed God's command. You see, that's the illustration of what John says sin is. Breaking God's commands, transgressing God's law. I also want you to notice before we move on tonight that a person can sin by doing something and also by not doing something. Uh, those are sins that we call sins of commission where you commit a sin and sins of omission where you don't do something or you omit something that you ought to do. And it is James, the writer of the, the New Testament epistle, who shows us both of those things. For instance, in James chapter 2 and verse 9, James says, If you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. See, that's something that was commanded for them not to do, and he'd already talked about that. Don't show partiality. God doesn't show partiality, neither should you. And if you do, you are sinning. Well, in, toward the end of that epistle, in James chapter 4, 
He shows us the sins of omission. That the fact that not only can we sin by doing something, but we can sin by not doing something. And that's the verse that many of you would probably be familiar with. James 4 and verse 17. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does it not, notice he does it not, to him it is sin. And so you can sin, friends, by doing something and by not doing something. That's the problem of what? Now, that is a very brief description of sin. I, I don't believe that's all there is to it, but that's all we have time for tonight. Let's move on to a second problem, and the problem of who? Who sins? Who is a sinner? Now, sometimes when we think about that word sin, as I mentioned this morning in the Bible class, we're tempted to only think about those people who commit the, quote, big sins. You know, the drunkards, uh, thieves, ra rapists, liars, and, and, and the big sins, you know, murderers and so forth. But friends, that's not how God views sin. It's not how God views sinners, as a matter of fact. When you turn to the book of Romans and Paul begins writing that letter that sometimes is described as one of the most difficult letters to understand in the New Testament... The first three chapters of that book are the easiest chapters to understand in my mind. And they can be summed up in this way. In Romans chapter 1, Paul shows the Roman church that the Gentiles were sinners. In chapter 2, he moves and shows that the Jews were sinners. And then in chapter 3, he kind of sums all of that up to show that all men are sinners. And that parallels quite nicely with what John says, 1 John 5 and verse 19, where there he makes the statement that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And some translations leave that part out and say the whole world lies in wickedness. I think the meaning is the same regardless of whether you're talking about the wicked one or the wickedness. And so all men are affected by this problem of sin. You say, well, what about good, religious, moral people? What about Christians? And I don't have to stand here really and tell you that they sin too. Good, moral people, religious people, true Christians, they sin. It's an inescapable fact. And maybe some people sin every day. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. I guess it varies from person to person. But regardless, we talked about two people this morning. Talked about the man Cornelius. We talked about the Ethiopian eunuch, and I re recall to your attention tonight that both of those men were religious people. Both of them were trying to do what they thought was right to please God. They were good moral people, men of high standing character and morals, and yet they were still sinners because they were lost, and they needed someone to tell them what to do to be saved. For Cornelius, that man was Peter, for the eunuch, of course, that man was Philip. And so all men, without exception, struggle with the problem of sin and will become sinners. Let's answer the problem number three, the problem of when. When does a person become a sinner? When does a person become a sinner? Well, it's not at birth. Now, you'd be surprised maybe to learn that some of your religious friends believe that. That a little baby... As innocent and pure as we might view it, they say the baby is born a sinner. Can you imagine that? That little baby who has never done anything wrong. The little baby who can't speak, can't walk, can't do anything on its own. And they say that it's born a sinner. Friends, the Bible doesn't paint that picture. To the contrary, the Bible paints the picture that when a baby is born, it is as pure and innocent as Jesus Christ Himself. Because it's not capable of committing sin. Doesn't know what sin is. Doesn't understand the principles governing life and right and wrong. It cannot sin. There is no passage in any place of the Bible that teaches that a, a little baby is born in sin. Now if you use the New International Version of the Bible, this is one, one doctrine that the New International Version of the Bible actually teaches if you read it improperly. And I believe the verse is Psalm 51 and verse 5. And that's where David says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. 
Now that's the King James Version. You read the New International Version and you'll find something quite different. And the New International Version pushes the doctrine of total hereditary depravity, the idea that babies are born in sin. And that's simply not case, all, the case. All David was saying that he was born into a sinful and wicked world, not that he was born a sinner. As a matter of fact, if we turn to the book of Ezekiel, we find that uh, each person is accountable for their own sins. And, and when they claim that a baby is born a sinner, they say it's because they inherit that sin from someone else, chiefly Adam. That Adam's sin passes down from generation to generation and, and every person inherits that sin. But the book of Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 18 and verse 20 that the soul who sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. Sounds to me like just the opposite is true. That I only become a sinner when I know right from wrong and I choose the wrong over the right. So we, come, we become a sinner or can become a sinner only at the point when we become accountable before God. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 9, Paul makes this statement. I was alive once without the law, but when the, law, or when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And if you look at the context of what Paul is saying there, he is actually advancing this idea of accountability. There was a point in Paul's life which, in which he was not accountable to God for his actions because he didn't know right from wrong. And yet when he became of that age, he was accountable because he did know the difference between right and wrong. And, and of course Paul chose wrong sometimes, as do we. But how do we know when we've reached that point? Perhaps you've heard preachers talk for years about the age of accountability. You say, I've never read of that phrase in the Scriptures, and you won't find it in the Scriptures. It's not there. So how do we know when we reach that point? And I think the answer is quite simple. In Isaiah chapter 7, Isaiah is prophesying about the virgin birth of Christ. It says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and be with child, and shall bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And it's the very same passage where we find those great descriptions that he would be Emmanuel, the Prince of Peace, and so forth. But in that very same context, I want you to listen to what Isaiah says. Isaiah 7 and verse 16. And this is speaking about Jesus, the virgin-born Son of God. He says in Isaiah 7, 16, For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. Now, we're only interested in the first phrase of that verse, of course, but there was a time at which even Jesus didn't know to choose the good over the evil. Did Jesus ever uh, get into mischief as a little boy? Probably so. That's what little boys do, isn't it? <laughs> Doesn't mean he was a sinner, though. It's impossible. So you, you become a sinner when you are accountable to God because you know that you ought to choose good over the evil. And when a person has reached that point, they have reached the age of accountability. Let's answer another question, the problem of why. Why is sin a problem? Say, why do we have to talk about sin so much? Why do we have to put so much emphasis on it? And it's because of what it causes. Sin separates us from God. I, I often quote from Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 where Isaiah said, Your sin and your iniquities have separated between you and your God and hid His face from you that He will not hear you. Sin separates us from God. Sin brings death. Spiritual separation from God. Back in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4, uh, Ezekiel prophesying for God says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. But the soul who sins shall die. See, that's why we have to deal with the problem of sin. Anytime you, you don't deal with the sin problem, it leads to death. Always, without exception. And so, sin keeps us out of heaven. 
I have often told you that God is so pure and holy that He cannot allow sin to dwell where He is and He will not dwell where sin is. It's impossible. It goes against His very nature. He couldn't, couldn't do it even if He wanted to. He just couldn't. And we find in John chapter 8 and verse 21 a statement, I believe, made by Jesus Himself where we read this. I am going away and you will seek me and will die in your sin. They, they were going to die in their sins. Of course, I believe he's dealing with the, the Pharisees there, scribes and Pharisees perhaps, who often laid claim to their heritage of the fact that they were children of Abraham. We're Abraham. See, we've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say we can be made free? Well, if you die in your sin, you will not go to heaven. It cannot happen. And so the reason for obeying the gospel then is that man is in sin and he has a need to take care of. That's why sin is a problem. Now let's answer one more question. And, and this is really, uh, I guess, a, a way of invitation of sorts. Uh, this is the problem of how. How do we deal with this problem? There's probably not a person in the room who doesn't know the answer to that question. And we dealt with it extensively this morning in thinking about how Naaman cleansed his leprosy and saw the parallels between that and New Testament baptism, Great Commission baptism. No one can deny the fact that a person is only saved by the grace of God. Now, I don't intend to mean that that is the only thing that saves you, that there's nothing for you to do, but you can't be saved without His grace. In Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, Paul says, For by grace have you been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It is by the grace of God that mankind can and will be saved. But God's grace provided a sacrifice. You see, in Hebrews 2, and verse 9, the writer says, We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. See, it was God's grace that provided that sacrifice for our sins. You think about Abraham going to, to, to offer his child as he had been commanded by God himself. And, and the child looks up at daddy when they get to the altar and, and say, well, where's the lamb? And what does Abraham say to him? The Lord will provide and it was by God's grace on that account that that sacrifice was provided. It was by God's grace that the sacrifice of Jesus was provided. And so sin being a violation of the law demands that penalty be paid. Man cannot pay it because man has nothing to offer. We have nothing to offer God. As a sinner, that is. We can't clear ourselves. We can only face the consequence of our sin. And that, of course, again, is death. But in dealing with the sin problem, it, God has always required a blood sacrifice. You go back to the Old Testament system, you find that that blood sacrifice was to be of, of certain animals of a certain age and a certain kind who were perfect, without spot and without blemish. But when we come into the New Testament era, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4 says, It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sin. And I believe that even goes back to the Old Testament. The, the sacrifices that they made, they didn't take care of the sin problem. They only pushed those sins forward year after year after year after year until ultimately Jesus gave His life as a sacrifice. And at that point, the blood of Christ rolled forward and backward. And it was at that point that the sins were remitted and forgiven when the blood of Christ was shed and covered those sins. And so Jesus died for our sins that we would not have to pay the penalty. That's what Jesus did for us. But you see, receiving the benefits of God's grace and the sacrifice that that grace provided is conditional. In Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9, the writer says, Speaking about Jesus, though He were a son, yet He learned obedience by the things which He suffered. And having been perfected, He became the author of eternal salvation all those who obey Him. See, that's the condition. If you want to take care of this sin problem, if you want to rid yourself of the penalty of death, you must obey God. 
1 Peter 1 and verse 22 says that he says to the churches to whom he was writing that they had purified their souls in obeying the truth. See, that's the only thing that can do it. It's the only way to take care of that sin problem. And so we talked about the conditions this morning and we do week after week, sermon after sermon, hearing the Word of God, believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing the name of Jesus Christ, and being immersed for the forgiveness of sin. You see, the very nature of the problem of sin suggests urgency in dealing with the problem. Because the consequences, if you die in sin, you can't die in your sin and go to heaven. Because Jesus doesn't save anyone in their sins. If I die in sin, I will spend an eternity in hell. See, that's how urgent the problem is. And you might be struggling with this problem tonight and, and, and it might be a challenge for you. It's a challenge for me to deal with my sin problem. But if I wish to please God and live in eternity with Him, I've got to take care of that problem no matter what it means. So if you're a Christian tonight and you're struggling with the sin problem, come and repent. The Bible says that we are to confess our sins and to repent of our sins. And then the blood of Christ continues to cleanse our sins. That's what you need to do tonight to get right with God. Do that. Maybe you're here tonight and you're not a child of God. You've never taken care of your sin problem. Won't you come tonight and obey the gospel of Christ? Do those things that we mentioned. Let the blood of Christ cleanse you and make you pure and white as snow. If you need something tonight, one of these needs or something else, come and let us know while we stand and sing. On behalf of the Lawnville Road Church of Christ, I want to thank you for joining us today for our worship. If you ever have an opportunity, we invite you to join us at our physical location at 1301 Lawnville Road in Kingston, Tennessee. We hope you will come and experience the simplicity of New Testament Christianity to learn about God and to become a part of his family. If you have questions, if you would like to know more about the Bible, or if you would like a home Bible study, feel free to contact us by calling 865-717-0444. Or for more information, please visit our website at www.lawnvilleroadcoc.org. Again, we thank you, and we hope you have a blessed day.